Cedar Street Baptist Church, once again, I love you very, very much. It's the joy of my heart to be with you here this morning. And we enter into a new journey beginning today. So if you've been with us the past few weeks, we kind of started the new year as I walked through the Psalms. In my heart for all of us, the first few weeks was just to go back to the basics of enjoying the presence of God. That's really where my heart was. I wanted all of you to just draw near to God in the new year, stir your affections for Him, seek His presence. We're entering into a new series now uh, that's connected to that, but as we talked about discipled minds and and warm hearts, now we're going to be talking about those open hands, reaching out to other people. This sermon series that we're going to go through the next five weeks together is entitled, Who's Your One?, All right, and actually, as you saw in the promo video, it's an initiative of the North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. That gentleman that you saw there on the screen, he's actually the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he's Dave Chambers' former pastor, Mr. J.D. Greer, and uh, he's doing a great job leading our convention. Now, here's the deal. If you have any friends in the Southern Baptist Convention that are going through this with their own church, I want to tell you that the sermons are unique, okay? So... I didn't get a package of five or six sermons to print from top to bottom. I am preaching as God is leading. But the cards and the guides that I hope that you got today as you walked in, and if you didn't, you need to get one before the service is over. We've got some extras to give you. All these things are incredibly important because we as a denomination are doing everything we can to get our hearts and our minds and our hands where they need to be. And that's focused on the one. Focused on the one. I want to tell you what we're going to do now so that as we get to the end of the service, you're prepared. You may have heard a pastor stand up and talk about evangelism and outreach, and all it does is build conviction. Oh, I know I need to get out. I know I need to spend more time with non-Christians, loving on them, making them feel welcome. And you just feel that conviction, but it doesn't do anything. Maybe you're so overwhelmed that missions and evangelism is like an elephant. You don't know where to take the first bite. I can confess to you, that's my struggle. I build things up so big in my mind that I forget that you do these things one step at a time. So rather than giving you some grand idea, I'm going to give you one practical step, and we're going to take this step together for the next five weeks. So let me be as clear as I can. It is my expectation that every member of this church is going to choose one person And that one person is a person that you're dedicating for at least the next 30 days that you're going to pray for, that you're going to encourage, and that in some way you're going to share your faith with. Now, here's here's a little encouragement to you, okay? There are some of you who are outreach-focused and you're evangelistic and you're an outgoing personality, and so you're like, well, I do this every day, so this is going to be a breeze, Some of you are more introverted, and this idea maybe scares you a little bit. So let me just encourage you that God is just asking you to take one step, okay? That's all he's asking. In fact, I've been thinking about this a lot in my personal life. In the last year, I've I've read a lot of books on habits, because there's some bad habits I'd love to get rid of, and there's some good habits I'd love to get better at. And there's an author named James Clear that wrote a book in 2018 called Atomic Habits, and he teaches about microhabits. A microhabit is when you commit to doing something so small that you cannot fail at it. I'll give you, for instance, if you want to make a commitment to start walking or exercising, a microhabit is the night before you go to bed, you just put your sneakers by the door. And you make a commitment for the next seven days, even if I don't go outside, I'm going to get up and put the sneakers on. Now, there are some days you're so tired, you may get up, put the sneakers on, and go back to bed. But chances are, as you take that step, that micro habit, you're like, well, my shoes are already on. Maybe I need to go outside. I think evangelism is the same way. So if you have never taken time out of your day to pray for someone that doesn't know Jesus, that's the easiest thing you can do. Five minutes, one person. If you don't know how, we gave you prayer guides. For 30 days, you take a verse of Scripture, read it, and pray for that person. That's it. 
But maybe you're, you're good at the, at the prayer part, but that you're not so much good with outreach. So maybe the next step after you pray is just look for somebody that you can encourage, that you can lift up, that you can share the love of Christ with. So maybe you can pray and encourage, but maybe the next step for you is for the very first time you invite somebody to church. And maybe you're good at inviting somebody to church, so maybe you're doing all those things and the next thing you can do is share your faith, share what God's doing in your life. And if you've gotten further down the chain of this habit, maybe you really do get to the point where you share the good news, the plan of salvation, and tell them how they can be saved. The key here is not transaction, but transformation. We're not doing this so that you go out and try to get people to pray a prayer to believe in Jesus and walk the aisle and sign the card and join the church. we got to get past that. You need to hear me clearly on this. You need to have a love for the world, a desire for souls to come to know Jesus. And if you come across someone that doesn't know Jesus, chances are, no matter what you say, think, or do, they're not going to give their lives to Jesus in one moment. Some of them, if they're living in a very sinful lifestyle... They need to consider the cost of what they're going to give up to follow Jesus. They're going to lose their support system. And they're going to, they're going to lose an awful lot. And they need to know what they, they would gain as being a part of this church family or another church family in this community. But that takes time. We don't force people to make decisions, but we continue to let God use us to help them move down the link on the chain. If they're an atheist... Hopefully you can help them to become at least an agnostic and say maybe there is a God. If they're agnostic, maybe you can get them to believe that there is a God and and know it for sure. If they're a deist and they believe that there's a God but they don't know who that God is, then you're helping them to see that there is one true God. And if they do believe in the one true God but they haven't given their lives to Jesus Christ, your life may be the testimony that God uses for them to finally confess with their tongue that Christ is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead and bend their knee to his lordship for the rest of their lives. One step at a time. So instead of just blowing the horn of evangelism, I'm giving us all one tangible step we can take. And at the end of our time together this morning, we're going to be writing that name of that one person, just their first name. We're not writing last names. You're not putting your name on the card. We're not paying attention to who's praying for who. You're just writing one first name on the card of who God is putting on your heart that you can pray for, that you can encourage, and that you can share your faith with. And I pray if each, each of us in this room take just one step to reaching out to the lost, Candler County will never be the same. Never be the same. And that's my prayer. Now, as we begin this series, I, I want to open up with a short story, um, really just uh, sharing with you what my thoughts have been the past week. Now, I know not everybody in here is a sports fan, and the moment I say the word sports, some of you check out on me, but stay, stay tuned. Even if you're a casual sports fan or not a sports fan at all, if you've watched the news, there's been one story that has dominated the headlines every day this week. In fact, if, you, if I was to say, what's the first name of the person that's dominated the headlines? Go ahead and say it. Kobe. Kobe. That's exactly right. Here's the deal. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that he and I were great friends. He's from my hometown. He's a year older than me. We went to rival high schools. I saw him play all the years of my childhood. When he was 13 years old, everyone said he was going to be the next Michael Jordan. He came pretty close. Some would argue that he is, but MJ is still still the plumb line for me. But even if you didn't grow up in Philadelphia, and even if you're a casual sports fan, or maybe you're not even a sports fan at all, you can't help but wonder what a tremendous impact his life made. But as much as people are thinking about, oh, what a great player, oh, what a lasting impact he had as a player, what a great work ethic, that Mamba mentality and all these things they've been talking about, I'm going to be honest with you, I wasn't thinking about that this week. I'm going to tell you what I was thinking. All that he did in his life for 41 years, still at his physical peak, maybe not as a player, but as a 41-year-old, still thinking that he had probably half his life in front of him still, And at 180 miles an hour with eight other people in an airplane that was going south in a hurry, he crashed into a field and his soul 
catapulted into eternity like that. And let me say this. I don't know his heart. He was a professing Roman Catholic. He could very well have been saved. I don't know. What I do know is this. When he stands as where he is now in the presence of God, his five championship rings, his 17 all-star appearances, his two all-star MVPs, his one league MVP, his two Olympic gold medals, none of those amount to anything at the day of judgment. They will not get him a seat at the front. They're not unimportant, okay? They're not, all right? He blessed a lot of people. He changed lives. He, he entertained fans. He used the gift that God gave him, and it reached probably his full potential as a player. But what did he do with those things to glorify God? I'm not saying he didn't. I'm saying I don't know. And I've heard bits and pieces of his benevolence, and he could very well be in God's presence in heaven, and I'd be able to shake his hand in the kingdom. I hope that's true. But what I do know is this. When things like that happen, it forces us to think about eternity and what really matters. I could not get out of my head the words of the great C.T. Studd, who said, "'Tis one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last.'" That's it. All the human achievements gone. Only what's done for Christ will last. So we're going to read in a moment Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. It's a heavy passage, and I'm going to need you to stick with me on this. All right, this is a, this is a serious topic. We are going to be talking about hell. And a lot of pastors decided not to preach this topic anymore but I love you too much not to preach the truth. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and let me share the big idea. What do I want us to know as we turn to Luke 16? Here it is in one sentence. We all face one universal reality. Our earthly lives determine our eternal destination, and our only hope is the gospel. We all face one universal reality. Our earthly lives determine our eternal destination, and our only hope is the gospel. So, if you would join me at this time by turning again to Luke chapter 19, verse 31. If you don't have a Bible, grab the pew Bible in front of you or beside you. We're on page 1041 in your pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy infallible, inerrant, and fully sufficient word. We are in Luke chapter 16, and we'll be reading verse 19 through the end of the chapter in verse 31. Hear God's word to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, these words written in red. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham! Have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so they may warn them, lest they also come into the place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for this day. 
Father, we confess that we need you at this hour. Father, I pray that every soul in this room would feel the true weight of this passage. And I pray that you help me as a pastor, as your instrument, to share these words in grace and truth. To share these words in grace that I don't know a person's soul and I can't determine who's in heaven and hell, only you can. But also in truth that heaven and hell are real places and the only way we avoid one to go to the other is Jesus Christ. Would you be with us now and let us consider this one reality that all of us will face. I need your help, Lord, and I beg you to help us and help me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you had to make a list of the favorite things that you want to preach, this probably wouldn't make the top five for me. But again, I'm not ashamed of it either. What I am ashamed of are churches and pastors that either have completely ignored this passage and others about hell, or there are some churches that make this what they preach every Sunday, and they're nothing but hellfire and brimstone. And let me just say this, God is a God of love and holiness, and you can't separate one from the other. We need grace, but we need truth. We need love, but we need holiness. And so I pray that God would help me to have a balance in this. Because this is incredibly important, and we suppress this truth a, a lot to where we don't understand or we forget what's at stake. So let me give us a context, and then we'll walk right into to the passage starting in, in, uh, in verse 19. But the format of this is a parable. In fact, Jesus is someone who is incredibly powerful in his use of parables. And uh, he loved telling stories because he knew that stories are something that we could understand. Right? He knew that, that stories were something that all of us could connect with. And I love how Brother Eddie puts this, others have put it this way as well. A way to define a parable, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly truth. And that's what Jesus is doing. In fact, he's doing it multiple times in the Gospels. As we look in this chapter, chapter 16, this is actually the second straight parable that he tells. And he's telling it using an illustration of money and honor. And why is he doing that? Well, the next thing I want to say is you need to know the audience that Jesus is speaking to before we can apply it to our lives. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, and they were actually quite wealthy, and they were in the highest seats of honor in Jewish life. It's kind of hard for us to think that way today because we often think of religious leaders as those who are the most impoverished. Uh, and some of that is because of Catholicism and those who have vows of poverty, uh, but some of that is just because that's the reality that we live in today. Uh, I did not get into pastoral ministry to build up my financial portfolio, I can promise you. Uh, but in, in, in these biblical times, the Pharisees were wealthy and they were in seats of high honor. And God is not rebuking their wealth or their honor. What He is rebuking is the use of that for His glory because they forgot who they were. They forgot who God was, and they forgot what their calling was to shepherd the flock of Israel. And so these parables are a rebuke to the Pharisees. But unless you, if you think for a moment we don't fit into this category, I'm going to prove that we need to take notice that he's speaking to us too. He's speaking to us too. And what he's telling us is that there are eternal consequences of earthly decisions. Now, one distinction I want to make before we walk into the text is this, Okay. Wealth by itself is not evil, and poverty by itself is not righteous. All right? So just because someone's wealthy doesn't mean they're, they're living in sin. And just because someone is, is poor and in poverty, it doesn't mean there's something special and righteous about their poverty. So we need to make that clear right at the outset so that we don't get confused by this. What he's saying is, what we're doing on earth is a reflection of our faith. And these decisions that we make on earth will, will have an effect on our consequences for all of eternity. We'll have consequences for all of eternity. So I want us to look at three realities that affect every single one of us. And I want us to listen closely as we walk through the text. So number one, I want us to look at our earthly reality. Okay, our earthly reality. 
All right? In verses 19 through 21, Jesus is highlighting a rich man who doesn't have a name and a poor man that does have a name, the name of Lazarus. So let me start with the earthly reality of the rich man, okay? He doesn't have a name, but he has an elite financial status. He's known by his wealth. He's called the rich man. And and Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, not giving the rich man a name because he wants the Pharisees to finally see themselves in this man. Now, how do we know he's wealthy beside the fact he was called a rich man? Well, he's clothed in purple and fine linen. Most of us know in the Bible that the, the color purple is for royalty. When Jesus was being mocked before he was put on the cross, they put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns and, and hailed him king of the Jews sarcastically. All right, so that color of purple is royalty. But one of the reasons it is royalty is this it was incredibly expensive. For a person to have even one article of clothing in biblical times that was purple, it had to be Phoenician dyed wool. And that was not cheap. All right, so if anyone had the color purple on, they went to great lengths and they spent great money to show the world, I'm wearing purple because I have money. I'm somebody important. You need to pay attention to me. That's what the color purple represents. All right, clothed in purple and fine linen. It also says that he feasted sumptuously every day so that for him a daily diet was a lavish feast. It doesn't say that he was a glutton, but it kind of hints towards that. And then the last thing it says, it points to the fact that he lived in a gated community. Why? Because Lazarus was waiting at his gate. All right? It's not, again, not to say that there's un- something sinful about living in a gated community, but only the point, 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 one percent of the world lives in a community surrounded by a gate, unless, of course, you're in prison, but that's another story. Okay, this is a different type of gated community. All right? That's the rich man. That's his earthly reality. Now, let me talk about the earthly reality of Lazarus. All right? This is a poor man. He actually has a first name. God gives him a first name in this story, partially because I believe Jesus wants the Pharisees to know no matter what condition a person's in, they have a human soul and they're worthy of dignity and respect, no matter who they are. So he has a name. And his name is Lazarus. And he's covered in sores. We don't know if he had a specific type of disease. We don't know exactly what the specifics are. We do know that his sores were debilitating. He was in anguish and he could not find relief for his anguish. And we know that he was so poor that he was hungry and he became a willing beggar. He wanted the scraps from the table of the rich man. And this passage leads us to believe that he did not receive those scraps, though he begged. And to add insult to injury, he was licked by dogs. Now, lest you have this vision in your mind of the dogs of America in 2020, these beautiful animals we have in our homes that are wonderful pets, some that uh, in this church and in others that love their pets so much they're a part of their wedding parties, right? I mean, these are, we love our pets, and we should. Dogs are beautiful. They're my favorite animal. But the way that we perceive dogs today versus how the Jews perceived dogs in the Old Testament, completely different story. They saw dogs as ceremonially unclean, and the presence of dogs was almost seen as judgment. And you know, I I, I first caught on to this on the mission field. When I was with my wife and Dave and others, we were in El Salvador. The dogs in that community are not someone you'd let inside and open up a can of Alpo. All right, they were all impoverished, they were skin and bones, and they all looked like dingoes. They had these really nasty look on their face, and so you did whatever you could to get away from the dogs of El Salvador because they were seen as unclean in that community. And I think that's pretty close to what it was in biblical times. So when it says that the man was licked by dogs, it wasn't a cute little puppy coming up and playing with him. It was an agitating dog that was, was, was making him hurt even more. And he's saying, shoo, dog, shoo. And they're coming up and licking him. And they're just making him live in anguish and torture even more. All right? That's what's happening as he's being licked by the dogs. So let, let us apply this to ourselves. So you're, you're listening to this and you're saying, okay, Bo, I, am not, I don't live in a gated community. Most of you probably don't. Some of you may. But and I'm also not so poor that I've got sores all over my body and dogs licking me all the time. So how does this fit with me? Well, let me stop for a moment and say this, because I do know that we live in 
America in 2020. I want to say in this parable, I'm going to challenge everybody in this room to think of yourself as the rich man. You say, well, I'm not a rich man, Bo. Which my response to you is this. The median income of a household in southeast Georgia is probably somewhere in the low to mid-30s. And we're on the low end, I get that. We're not the wealthiest community on the planet. But I want you to think about this for just a second. Let's say as a family, you make $35,000 or somewhere close to that. And you work for 35 or 40 years. When you die, you're going to stand before God and give an account of how you shepherded and managed over a million dollars. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Okay, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But that means that everyone in this room is going to stand before God a millionaire. You say, well, I don't have a million dollars. If you live long enough, you will. You maybe not have it all at one time, but in the span of your life, you will. And you'll have to give an account for every penny. And God's going to say, you love me. How did you use this money to glorify me? So in that respect, now we can see how dangerously close all of us are to being the rich man in this parable. So I believe our wealth will always reflect our faith. I think it reflects our faith in how we advance God's kingdom. All right, that's our understanding of the gospel of Christ. It reflects how we minister to other people. That reflects the love of Christ. And it also reflects our understanding about eternity. That reflects the judgment seat of Christ. See, because 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we're going to be judged by everything that we've said and done in the body, not for salvation, okay? That's only by faith in Jesus Christ, but a judgment of works for rewards, for evaluating how genuine our faith is. So in that respect, our money will say a lot about what is true of our faith. It will. It will always be true of of our faith. So that's our earthly reality. Now I want to shift gears to eternity. Number two, I want to look at one eternal reality. In verses 22 through 26, now we see that the rich man and Lazarus have both died, and we, we find out a lot about what happens in eternity. The first thing I want to say as we look at point two is the eternal reality of a great chasm between us and God. I don't know if you know this, but you can't deny this reality even if you want to. Nobody is born in a relationship with God. No one. You're a child of Adam and Eve who sinned, and you're part of their lineage, and I'm part of their lineage, which means we are born separated from God. Nobody's born saved, okay? There's nothing in Scripture that will say the day somebody was born, they were already a follower of Christ. That's why the Bible says you need to be born again, So nobody's born saved. You are born separated from God, and God loves you, and God desires for you to be adopted into his family, and he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for the forgiveness of your sins that you could come into his family and experience that love. But that only happens by faith. And once we die, we have no more ability to make any decisions that will affect our eternity. The moment we die, it's fixed. It's fixed. All right, so there's a chasm between us. And if Jesus Christ is not the one that closes that chasm, okay, if he doesn't close that chasm, we'll die in the same reality that we're living with that we're not aware of. And how does he do it? I need you to listen closely. Jesus is the only one that has a hand in the kingdom of God and also the hand in the earth reaching out to man so that God and man can be met together on the cross. This is why, by the way, all the other religions of the world can't cross that chasm. Jesus has to be both God reaching down to man and he has to be man reaching up to God. And he's the only way to cross the chasm from eternal death in hell to eternal glory in heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way. And so we find out in this passage the, the reality of these two people. All right, so I want to start with the, uh, the poor man because he reverses the order here. The reality of the poor man. First of all, he dies, and it doesn't say anything about him being buried, which means he died in obscurity. Nobody knew that he died. There was no funeral. There was no tributes. There was no honor. He just died. 
But when he did die, the passage says that he was carried by angels to the bosom of Abraham. Now, what does Abraham's bosom represent? It represents what we call the temporary heaven or the intermediate state. And I'll tell you in a moment exactly what that is. But why do they say Abraham's bosom? Well, Abraham is the father of the Jewish faith. And they believe in the kingdom as we do too, that there's going to be a feast. And in Jewish t- and in biblical times, the Jews would recline at the table and lean into each other. So being by Abraham's bosom meant you had a prominent seat at this banquet feast. But to make it uh, plain and clear, this is heaven. And a lot of people don't know this, but you need to hear me. When someone who's a Christian today dies, and it says to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord, they're in paradise, but that heaven is not the eternal heaven. That's a temporary place of paradise, but they won't fully know heaven until they're on this side, all right, until they get a new body and heaven and earth collide. So Abraham or Lazarus is at Abraham's bosom, and he's in the kingdom, and he's in joy. All right, it says that um, basically that he's no longer in anguish. All right, he is um, receiving comfort, carried by angels on the side of chasm. That's the side of God. Now let me flip the script and talk about the rich man. It does say in the passage that the rich man was buried. What does that mean? He probably had a huge funeral. He had a three-hour viewing. He had all the best food at the reception. He had all the best preachers at the service. Probably had three different pastors all up here like dueling banjos talking about how great he was. But guess what? What happened right after the tomb was closed? He went to the bad place, not the good one. The place that we pretend doesn't really exist. The place that we say a loving God would never send anybody But I want to stop and say this for just a moment. If you're one of those people that say, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? I would say this. If you don't believe that's true, then why do we have a cross? When you look at that cross, that's the holiness and love of God that met in one place. If God was not holy, we wouldn't need a Savior. And if God wasn't loving, He never would have sent His Son to be our Savior. He is holy, and we need to be saved of our sins. And He is loving, and He did send His Son to die for us as the only way that we can cross that chasm and be with Him forever. The cross is where the holiness and love of God meet together. And so we need to understand a loving God and a holy God made a way for us to be saved, but if we do not receive that offer of salvation... As much as God loves us, His holiness will not permit us to be in His presence because of our sin, and we will be separated with Him for all of eternity. We will be separated for all of eternity. All right, now here's the thing. You need to hear this. The rich man could see Abraham, so he was aware that he was in anguish and that there was another place that he could not get to. And here's something else that needs to sober you real quickly. He called out Father Abraham, which means he himself was a Jew, and he probably thought he was saved by his heritage. And let me tell you what scares me. There are many of us in this community who think we're saved because of what family we come from. Well, mama and daddy always been in church. They brought me up in vacation Bible school. I got baptized when I was 13. And my answer to that is great. How does your life right now reflect your faith? I don't care what you did in a moment. Anybody can do that in a moment. Now, there are some people that are genuinely saved at 13, and genuinely their baptism is a genuine reflection of a genuine faith. But for many of us, we lean on these decisions. We lean on the faith of our family. And guess what? When you stand before God, your family won't be there. And so this rich man, he's aware that he's in a place that he can't get out of. This is eternity, and he's in torment. He's saying, I just wish that the end of my tongue was cooled by a dip of water. So this place that he calls Hades, this is the temporary hell that souls that don't know Jesus are in right now. It's not the permanent hell because the final judgment hasn't come yet, but it's a place of separation from God where they're aware of their need for salvation. And he's aware that he can't cross this chasm. And here's the deal. 
even in hell, he's still not repenting of his sins. Still. You know what he says, Father Abraham? Let you tell Lazarus to come here and serve me. Tell him to dip his finger and come touch my tongue. He's still treating Lazarus like a second-class human being in hell. You know, maybe you have this picture of hell as people are in torment and they're crying out, God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. That is not what hell is. There will be no repentance in hell. There will be no confession of sin in hell. You know what there will be in hell? It's the Bible says weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what that is? That's God, how dare you? How dare you? I curse you. That is what hell is going to be. Not, oh God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. That will not happen in hell. Souls that are eternally separated from God will turn inward and the pride they had on earth will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and their anger towards a holy God will get greater and greater and greater. And that's what's happening with the rich man. He's looking and saying, Father Abraham, you do this. Send him here. Send him to do this. And they speak very clearly. Abraham said, child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he's comforted and you are in anguish. And then he drops the bomb on him here in verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. So he's aware that he cannot make any more changes. His, the decision about his soul for all of eternity has already been fixed. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. The Bible does not teach what Catholics believe, purgatory, that you can work off all the sin before you get into heaven. No, the Bible says in Hebrews, it is appointed for every man to live once, and then comes judgment. This is the only chance we get, and it's over in the blink of an eye. So that's the reality for all of us. We are unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny. We're going to go to one place or the other. And it won't be because of our good works. However, if we are truly Christian, our works will be a result of our faith, our desire to reach out to other people, our sacrifice of time and money and gifts and efforts for other people will be evidence that we truly do love Christ. Jesus says, he who has my commandments and obeys them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 14, 21. Obedience reveals our heart. And these decisions will seal our fate. And that's why Jesus is our only hope. So let me move on to our third point here. We've talked about one earthly reality, one eternal reality. Finally, I want us to look at one evangelistic reality. In verses 27 through 31, what happens is the rich man is saying, All right, if if I can't fix my reality, if I'm stuck in hell forever, can you at least send someone to go tell my brothers that they don't come and they don't face the same judgment that I'm facing right now? Warn them. I don't want them to be tormented the way that I'm tormented. He had a concern for their eternity, and he had a concern that they would have hope. But the response to him is this. It's good that you have a concern for human souls, and it's good that you want them to have hope But the the, the offer for them to have hope is the same offer that you received, that you rejected. Here's what it says. Listen very closely. It says, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Translation, They have the Bible. They have the scriptures. Let them listen to the word of God. And if they won't listen to the word of God, they are not going to pay attention if somebody comes back from the dead to tell them to repent. And then Jesus drops this bomb in the very end of the parable. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Who rose from the dead? And who did not believe him? The Pharisees who were listening to this parable. He's saying, if you, are, if you won't pay attention to the scriptures then if someone even rose from the dead, you still wouldn't believe. And the Pharisees would say, well, no, I believe the Scriptures. I'm a Pharisee. I teach the Scriptures. And Jesus is saying, if you knew the Scriptures, then you would know me because the Scriptures testify about me. In Luke 24, and they're walking on the road to Emmaus, it says he interpreted to those men all the Scriptures from Moses and the prophets, all the things concerning him. The whole Bible's about Jesus, and there are some of the Jews that got it, and there are some of the Jews that didn't get it. 
And he's saying, even if I rise from the dead, you already had everything you need in the word of God. And I say that to everybody in this room today. There are some people waiting for God to give them a sign. Now, I want to confess this as we get near to an end here. When I was, I got, most of you know my testimony, I got saved at 26 years old. I was raised in a Catholic home, didn't know the Lord. I believed in a God, and I believed in Jesus, but he was certainly not my Lord and Savior. And the year that I came to faith, I remember over and over praying that God would show me a sign. And you know what? In my ignorance, there were things that he did. There were. I remember the one time I was crying. I think I shared this story before. I was crying out about a boss that I had that was so awful to me. And I said, I wish you could see how hard I work. And I was in a traffic jam and I slammed the brakes on and the car right in front of me had a license plate that said, God sees. But you know what? Guess what happened a day after that? God showed me another sign. That sign wasn't good enough. God, show me something different. I'm really insecure today, God. You know, I, 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 I believe that maybe that was you, but I'm not quite sure. I need some more proof. I need this. I need this. I need this. If you are trusting in signs for if God is real or hell and heaven are real, no sign will ever be enough. This is what God has given us. It is his word. And I was 27 years old before I believed that that was the word of God. And what, what uh, Jesus is saying in this parable is this, the word, and specifically the gospel, the message of the word, that is enough. And those who will put their faith in Christ when they hear the word, they'll be saved. And those who reject the gospel and are not saved, they wouldn't be saved if Jesus rose from the dead and told him himself. So what he says to the Pharisees in the parable, I'm saying it to all of us right now. We already have enough. We've got all the hope that we need to take out of the walls of this church to the community that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my summary statement here. To sum it all up, I'd say, facing the one reality that everyone needs Christ must move us to share our faith with at least one person. Facing the one reality that everyone needs Christ must move us to share our faith with at least one person. All right, again, this is not a guilt trip. This is a heart check. Do you believe what Jesus said in that parable? Do you believe that heaven and hell are real places? Do you believe that none of us can get to heaven on good works? Right now, there are people who volunteered at the American Red Cross and Habitat for Humanity and fed the hungry every week for 50 years that are not in heaven. And there are also mass murderers who came to faith in Christ in their jail cell and they're in, in glory right now because it's the work of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins that gives us eternal life. Now, if you believe this, that heaven and hell are real and you don't want anybody to go there, instead of just having that conviction and that guilt and then going to lunch and forgetting about it, that can, remember the challenge is taking just one step just one. All right, I want to say this. I'm not the strongest evangelist on the planet. I'll preach the gospel to anyone who asks questions, but I'm not the most aggressive guy to go knocking on doors and standing on street corners. So I'm not asking that of you. I'm not. What I am asking is this. In a moment, we're going to enter into a time of silence. And here's all I'm asking. Let God put on your heart and mind one person. Could be a family member. Could be a friend. Could be a neighbor. Could be a coworker. Could be a teammate. One person. And, and let God put that, as we go into silence, just silently say, God, who's this one person that you want me to share my faith with? Who's this one person that I can pray for and encourage and invite to church and share my faith with. And I want you to write it on that prayer card that we handed out to everybody. All right, I'm gonna, we're going to enter into silence, and then when we break the silence, I want you to write that first name. Do not write your name on the card. I don't want to know. Do not write that person's last name on the card. We don't want to embarrass anybody. But we're going to enter into silence. I'm going to lead us in prayer. 
We're going to write that first name on the card, tear the card, and the card and the part where their name is written, not the Bible verse part, you keep that part. The other part that you tear, we're going to come down the aisle and we're going to put them in these, in these uh, baskets, okay? So some will come down this aisle, some will come down that aisle. We'll put them in the baskets and then we'll return to our seat for a closing hymn. Now, just so you know what we're going to do with those names, we're going to put them on a private, separate prayer list. First names only. We're not here to embarrass anybody. And our leaders are going to pray over those names. And those who have a desire to join us are going to pray over those names. And we're just going to pray, God, whatever it takes for that one person to come to know Jesus Christ. Now, I am expecting every member of our church to participate in this. If you're a visitor, it is totally okay to remain seated if you don't feel led to come forward. We don't, we don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. But I, I, I want to say this. If you can't think of anyone... Maybe it's one of two reasons. Maybe, number one, you've been living in a Christian bubble and you need to get out and love on some people who don't know Jesus, who are not like you. Or number two, maybe you're here today and you can't think of one because you are the one that we're praying for that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe you know his name, but maybe you're not following him. Maybe you're not serving him. Maybe your life doesn't belong to him. And so in our time of prayer, maybe for you it's not writing down a name. Maybe it's you asking God to save you through Christ. So let us enter into silence. I'll lead us in prayer. And we'll have about 60 seconds to write the names down. And then row by row we'll start coming forward. And at that time I'm going to ask our ushers who helped out this morning to guide us row by row uh, to come put it in the basket and go back to your seat. So let's pray. Lord, you know our church's desire for evangelism and missions, and, and yet we, we, bang the, we blow the horn of missions and bang the pulpit and talk about reaching out to the lost and sharing our faith with those who don't know the Lord and, and, and loving on others that don't agree with us and don't live the type of life that we live, to love them and reach out to them, Lord. And yet, at the same time, it's so intimidating, we don't know where to take the first step. Heavenly Father, right now I pray in the name of your Son and by the power of your Spirit that right now at this moment you would take one name and prominently place it on the heart of every person in this room who's willing to participate, Lord. One name, one family member, one friend, one co-worker, one neighbor. And simply give us the burden of knowing them and then wanting to pray for them encouraging them, and when time permits and availability permits, to share what you've done in our life, that you'll do it in their lives as well. Father, I pray that we'd fill up this prayer list with names of people that need to know you and that we would participate in, in praying, encouraging, and sharing that they would come to know you as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.